today. Uh, Dr. Moore, please, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for the invitation. I, I wish I was there in person. I did a sabbatical at Stanford a few years ago and it would be lovely to be back. But um, also really congratulations on the opening of CORES. Um, it's going to be successful and uh, I, I've really enjoyed uh, listening um, to most of the day. I had to step off briefly, but uh, it's been uh, really, really inspiring. So without further ado, I just wanted to give you some of uh, my disclosures. Uh, one is I'm sort of working on the Hong Kong principles, which I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm also part of the top group and uh, co-leading the top for academic institutions initiative, all of which I'm going to um, sort of be talking about today. And for those of you who sort of want to go or do something else, I thought I would just give you the, the take home message up front. And it, it seems to me what really needs to happen is that um, we need universities to, um, you know, to modify their very sort of old and stale um, criteria for promotion and tenure. Uh, we need them to think uh, newly about incentives and rewards for open science. And in, I include in that reproducibility. And um, I think that, um, you know, I come from this, uh, you know, not always from a scientific perspective, but, perspective, but often from a uh, research integrity perspective. And I, I think that, um, you know, I think in North America, we will achieve greater success if public funders uh, really introduce streams for uh, funding open science and reproducibility research. So, you know, my perspective is from a faculty of medicine and I'm particularly interested in research integrity and the notion of a trustworthiness in research. And if you look at the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, they're supposedly a robust and very influential group. Uh, they state that in return for the altruism and, true, and trust that make clinical research possible, um, it needs to be done ethically and reported honestly. And I would go well beyond clinical research here to include all types of research. And, and here is an example of, um, you know, a very nice piece of work that I think uh, was done by Ben Goldacre in Oxford and, and um, his group. And essentially what he did uh, a few years ago is he took some top uh, medical journals and he looked at um, uh, reports of uh, randomized trials. He went back to check and look at their protocols and he was interested in uh, switching of primary outcomes. And so they, they looked at 67, and what they found is that in actually 58 of the 67 cases, um, the primary outcome was switched. And by that, I mean, uh, let's suppose we were doing a, a randomized trial looking at an intervention to uh, reduce depression. And we were going to measure that, let's say, in using the Beck depression inventory or some other mechanism. And that's in the protocol. But when you go to look at the final report in the publication, you see actually depression is not even a primary outcome. And so, you know, this goes on quite a bit. And um, I put this, uh, Goldacre and colleagues published uh, uh, two pieces a couple of years ago. I think this is the, the more intriguing one because um, you know, there has been some criticism of, of how the COMPARE project was done. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say there is a disconnect uh, between um, honesty uh, and uh, reporting research. And I think the, the qualitative uh, analysis here sort of to me is akin to uh, when reproducibility doesn't work out. And there are differences of opinion between, in this case, um, you know, uh, journal editors, researchers, and the investigators, the compare team. And, and I think we ought to bear that in mind when, when we in, invoke uh, reproducibility 
research and how, how do we get over some of these problems. We also know uh, from uh, the Open Science Collaboration and a lot of other work that others have done that there is a um, sort of a disconnect between uh, actually being, being able to uh, reproduce the results of, of primary research. And another notion about trustworthy research is it has to be useful uh, to readers. And, um, you know, if we take uh, what I think was uh, a very nice theme uh, throughout the day is sort of sharing information, sharing data and, and thinking about open access. Now the Wellcome Trust uh, very early on in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, had an initiative about sharing research data and the findings and hundreds of organizations uh, signed up to this. Uh, including uh, Canadian federal funders, and, and they want it to look particularly good. And I don't know what the complete result is, but here's an, an, er an early analysis of, um, you know, over 500 articles. And what you find here is that, um, you know, um, first of all, less than a quarter of the authors made any mention of data availability and really, if you look about one in 10 actually made their data available. So, you know, lovely words, nothing's happening. And uh, despite all this, these, these folks are likely going to get uh, promoted and tenure and all the rest of it. So, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's a lovely paper by uh, Steve Goodman and colleagues um, where um, coming back to the notion of transparency and openness and completeness. Uh, towards the end of the paper, uh, Steve and colleagues state that none of these types of reproducibility can be assessed without complete reporting of all relevant aspects of the scientific design, conduct, measurements, data, and analysis. So, you know, it, it's not an esoteric thing we're after. It's something very pragmatic and really, really important. And, you know, if we look at the three vaccine trials from COVID, uh, what we see is that actually we cannot uh, get the data. Uh, if you look, this I think is the uh, Pfizer trial. You go to the bottom of the article and you see the data sharing statement. You, 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 may, you can make an application uh, to Pfizer, but that sure is no guarantee. The uh, Moderna one, they've just clearly stated the data is not going to be made available. So it's amazing that governments um, have spent, I don't know how many tens of billions of dollars, and yet they've not sort of set aside, you know, 0.0001% of that monies to actually see, uh, could this be replicated? Uh, should we just flat out believe all of these results and carry on? And it, it seems to me uh, very, very uh, sort of, short-sighted. And the fact that they're not making any of the data available seems to me to contrast or conflict with um, uh, work uh, Michel Mello um, and, and others uh, have done, indicating that, um, you know, my interpretation of, of, of this um, uh, paper is, is that in, the, in general, uh, patients want their data shared. Um, they uh, are really are sort of promoting that this is the way to go forward. And yet when we can see in a pandemic that is very public facing, that this information is simply not available and in some ways goes against of what patients want. And of course, patients are critical because you can't do these trials without patients. So I'm not going to spend my time going into some of the problems of uh, biomedical uh, publications. Some of them have been discussed earlier on. Uh, I think it's safe to say, and I think most reasonable people would agree that there are substantial problems. I think um, in contrast to uh, Dr. Krosas's, um discussion talk this morning, at least from a, a faculty of medicine perspective, data sharing is really not common. And I just want to sort of make that point quite clear. It's different, of course, for different disciplines. And, and, and so 
I always sort of wonder, given this sort of brief introduction, you know, how are researchers able to advance their careers? You know, there's no doubt all of these vaccine trial people will be putting all of this on their CVs and they'll be getting lots of accolades and, and maybe deservedly so. However, um, they are uh, uh, adopting de detrimental research practices uh, from a research integrity perspective, certainly from an open science perspective, which would include for me uh, reproducibility. And the question is, uh, in a sense, uh, does it have something to do with the perverse incentives and rewards at academic student, uh, at ac academic institutions? And, and I, I, we sort of set out to see what, what, what is going on in academic institutions, uh, in particular in faculties of, um, in faculties of medicine. And we uh, identified um, 170 institutions, uh, randomly sampled, I believe, from the uh, Leiden uh, groups uh, list of institutions. And we were particularly interested in seeing in uh, promotion and tenure documentation, whether cr traditional criteria were used, such as how many publications do you have and how many publications do you have in journals with an impact factor above, you know, six. And then the non-traditional or what I described as progressive, but the journal wouldn't allow me to use that term. Um, you know, was there any mention of uh, data sharing, any mention of publishing in open access, uh, mention of registration, etc. And what we found is, I think, two important results. One is that a fair number of institutions are not transparent. It, we don't know what the criteria is that they're using. It's um, not possible to get, even after uh, trying directly to, uh, to um, email um, the organizations. Of those organizations that do have this information, they are predominantly using traditional criteria. So there is no, you know, there's no strong open science or reproducibility in, in promotion and tenure uh, for folk. And, and so here is my institution. You know, the, uh, I mean, I'm predominantly seated in a clinical epidemiology program. It, it, it's very large, it's hundreds of people, hundreds of scientists, and, and this is what they're interested in. Uh, how many publications do you have, David? Uh, what are they, how many are an impact factor above five? What's your H index, David? What's your M quotient, M quotient, your M index, blah, 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 blah. So you see at this institution that I'm at, um, you know, this is the first question they ask. They're not going to, Open science won't come quickly. And, um, you know, that may or may not be okay. It depends on your perspective. And uh, it, I think we all know that, you know, uh, publications uh, are the currency for research. And um, that of course includes pr predatory journals for which there uh, are a, a great number and they're actually leaking into our, our trusted sources. Uh, we've done quite a lot of research showing that um, uh, predatory publications are included in people's CVs for promotion and tenure. And I think it's true to say that um, sort of university rankings are based in parts on, on, on productivity and, uh, you know, the number of publications and the number of grants. And uh, one could argue that the ranking scheme is uh, perhaps as crazy as the journal impact factor. But that's not uh, for discussion today, really. And so, you know, my call is, is really for institutions to move away from the current perverse incentives and rewards, which is, I believe, uh, very, very questionable research integrity and move towards, um, you know, in, in incentivizing and rewarding uh, trustworthy research. And I, I think that obviously includes um, open science and reproducibility. And there, there has been some work on this. Um, we're by no means the first people, and we certainly won't be the last, and perhaps we're not even the best. And I, I think most of this movement is, is coming from Europe, and it's sort of interesting, uh, sort of sociologically, why that is the case. And I would like to give a, a shout out to the DORA group, 
because they've sort of indicated that uh, we shouldn't use what my institution uses is journal impact factor uh, as a as a measure of uh, my career advancement. And um, we, uh, a group of us um, at uh, the 2019 conference, uh, the International Conference uh, on Research Integrity, um, proposed the Hong Kong principles. And um, the focus was on fostering research integrity uh, within the researcher assessment and to provide guidance on for promotion and tenure committees that might strengthen research integrity, which obviously includes open science. And uh, we were very keen on, on implementation that um, I, I think I'm just too stupid to uh, know science too well, but I'm very interested in practically, how would you be able to make this happen? And so uh, the Hong Kong principles were sort of published um, about six or seven months ago. It feels like six or seven years ago. And there are five principles. I'm not going to go through all of those uh, five today, but I did want to share with you a couple um, to see for you to see how this sort of fits in so well with, uh, with open science. So the, the first principle of the Hong Kong principles is, is value the accurate and transparent reporting of all research regardless of the results. And so here's an example of the health um, research board in Ireland that have um, open research. So it, it, any, uh, anybody who's funded by the health research board in Ireland uh, can publish their research with, without a fee. And um, it can be done um, relatively uh, quickly as well. Um, in, in other environments, um, uh, I think particularly psychology uh, is to be applauded um, for uh, developing registered reports. Um, this also might deal with um, issues of uh, publication uh, bias and, and some forms of, um, of reporting biases as well. And um, it, it, we also can see that um, uh, reporting guidelines would also be helpful uh, in, in terms of uh, accurate and transparent of reporting. And there is a randomized trial evidence to support the use of, in this particular case, consort, which is a reporting guideline for randomized trials. So it's, it's not sort of asking people to do things because we, we think it's important. We're ask, asking, uh, people to do things because there is evidence to support that um, um, reporting guidelines are, are a, a good intervention for improving completeness and transparency. And uh, Cambridge University um, came up with this notion of data champions, but the, uh, uh, the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands sort of took this a step further. Uh, in, in terms of uh, valuing the practices of open science, such as open methods and data. And, and what the Technical University of Delft did was, they said that if, if there are people who help others make their data open and available, they can use this as part of the promotion and tenure port portfolio. And I think that this is very, uh, it's a very strong statement. And I think it's just another example where doing some of these activities is actually not a particular fiscal cost. There are other costs, but it, it can be done. So, um, you know, the Hong Kong principles gives this example and other examples of, of how you can incorporate uh, uh, open science into uh, promotion and tenure um, um, criteria. Now, one thing that wasn't discussed today that I'm a bit neurotic and crazy about is this notion of uh, dashboards. I think one of the reasons that people don't succeed is they don't know how well they're doing and they don't know universities don't, haven't benchmarked themselves. So, you know, um, uh, we are working uh, a lot with the, um, the Quest Center at the Berlin Institutes of Health to really take this a step further 
to, to have automated digital das dashboards for um, open science and, and reproducibility practices. And, and here's a prototype that we're working on. And um, here is um, the Quest team have um, a dashboard sort of ongoing within, um, within their own organiza organization, the, the Charité Hospital. And um, we're, I, I don't think I can say anything publicly today, but we, we hope to be able to announce soon that we will be working with um, some very large uh, hospitals to um, implement dashboards on open science practices. And so here, for example, you can see on my left hand uh, screen that the at the Charité is 55% of publications, I, I believe it's from uh, 2019, are, are open access. And this is all automated. It's digitally picked up uh, as, as metadata and automated. And, and we're sort of looking uh, here at the sort of the best types of uh, interface uh, uh, for, for users. So um, another example of, of benchmarking, again, uh, my thanks to the uh, Berlin team for sharing this. Uh, these are all the medical schools in Germany and they're in a sense benchmarking and comparing uh, a trial registration in, 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 and uh, looking to see, um, you know, ha, ha, <clears throat> what uh, what proportion of of um, trialists are, are publishing their results, and and we can say that sort of um, it, it's it's slightly less than forty percent, and and this is uh, fed back immediately. Uh, they they can get this uh, sort of uh, live. And, and this is what we need to do uh, across the board uh, for, for institutions to be able to see how well they're doing and, and what uh, implementation strategies could be done to um, you know, make the thresholds higher. So again, this is Ben Goldacre's work, looking at trials, a trial tracker, uh, where we can really see how well uh, the FDA are doing with uh, reporting their trial results, and uh, you know he's he's indicating that seventy one percent of them are reported, but he's also indicating that uh, the U.S. government could have um, um, you, you know made perhaps quite a lot of money uh, to to funnel back into research and didn't. So these are dashboards that again, uh, in terms of audit and feedback, are, are very very powerful and. I think for open science, uh, we really we really need to to integrate them uh, into into academic institutions. And um, just to share with you that uh, data sharing is is really um, uh, as as I mentioned, it, it, it's not particularly uh, common. Here are two uh, recent papers uh, from um, uh, different groups. And um, unless we are going to develop dashboards that we can uh, live stream back to journals, it, it, things will not change. And that's partly because journals don't know how they're doing. All of this work in a sense is that, that we're doing here, it's, it, it's um, it requires an enormous amount of human effort to do this, and um, we can't update it in, in, in a quick and easy manner. Uh, despite the fact that there is evidence that, for example, data sharing is associated with added value, and one would imagine uh, universities and funders would be particularly interested in this, and yet if we can't feed back information to them, they certainly won't know this. And so the, the transparency and openness promotion guidelines are, were really uh, developed to try to see um, where transparency and openness uh, was at in, in journals. And here are uh, some of the examples and, and the sort of response gradation that uh, is, is possible to use or is used. And if you go on to, uh, you can go on to the, um, into Center for Open Science and look at the top guidelines. 
And, and I have two journals up here because I, I wrote very recently a commentary for the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology about data sharing in COVID. And even though the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology is a signatory of the top guidance, they don't do very well. Um, let's just leave it at that. And if you actually compare the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology to another signatory journal, eLife, you can see a tremendous disparity. Now, in, unless that's sort of fed back as a dashboard to, um, uh, to these journals, instead of them having to go in and look, then they won't know how they're doing. And, and I can assure you, um, being on the advisory board for the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, they would much prefer to be doing better and closer and perhaps even beating Eli for other such journals. So um, what, what we're going to do with this idea is, is really look at it for uh, academic institutions. Um, are academic institutions, uh, are, they, are they promoting openness and transparency? And so, for example, if you, um, if, if you look at uh, data set citation, the current institutional standards, and then we have a, a basic top for institutions and an advanced top for institutions. And we're, we're working our way through getting these grades a, a little bit more granulated. But the idea is that we would do this, have a dashboard and be able to push this out uh, to academic institutions and, 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 and to funders a little bit later on. And I, I think, you know, we would like to use this sort of automated digital dashboard notion to put a top for academic institutions and push, push that out, provide people with a constant audit and feedback. And uh, I've, I've sort of um, gone through this. I, I probably forgot the slide was here. My apologies. And I wanted to sort of pick up a, a little bit on some discussion about uh, uh, CVs. Um, I don't know how many of you have been unfortunate to have to be an applicant on the Canadian Institute of Health Research, but it is a system that's uh, probably uh, best suited to the 18th century. Uh, I'm a co-applicant on the Australian Research Council and if it's possible to have an organization that's actually worse than CIHR, it's a strong contender. And academic institutions, they need to implement uh, open science best practices, and they, they need to use that information for hiring, promotion, and tenure. I believe uh, it would be very interesting if we, for example, could get the, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to offer up a prize for constructing and automating and populating CVs that automatically pick up metadata that would populate a CV around issues of data sharing, registration of studies, etc. The, the current system is, is well, it's a failure. Uh, that's, uh, I don't think I need to say any more about that. And, and uh, Jeff Flyer, um, who was the Dean of Medicine uh, at Harvard for a, a decade, sort of indicated that we also need to think about um, reproducibility um, in the uh, in the promotion and, and tenure uh, portfolio. Uh, I I did want to mention just a, a, a little bit of work that um, some of us are doing, um, looking at reproducibility in the context of. Um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Uh, this is uh, work that's um, uh, headed up by Matt Page in, in, in Melbourne. And um, I'll leave that. Uh, we are doing a, a series of studies um, uh, looking to see about uh, sharing of review uh, materials across CVs and, and looking at reproducibility of meta-analyses as well um, and um, in using some sort of innovative ways of trying to do that. And I did want to mention something that I've not seen in the literature too much and something that I've not seen 
it discussed is, is whether it's possible to think about um, individual patient data meta-analysis uh, as a measure of reproducibility so that in a sense, um, e each row here, e each row is a separate study done by separate um, um, investigators and whether actually the, the, um, the forest plot that we see here uh, whether that tells us anything about reproducibility and whether we can think of reproducibility in, in, this, uh, in this context. And uh, Alan uh, Finko is um, sort of the outgoing uh, chief scientist. Um, and, and I think he said this very nicely, that people respond to incentives and change will come only when grants and promotions and are continuing upon best practice. And I think we need to really think about open science as, as best practice and incentivize it. And I just wanted to say a few words about uh, sort of any change it needs to be couched in evidence and appropriately evaluated. And, and clearly, you know, I, I, I want to be of course reasonable here we don't actually need to know that uh, using parachutes uh, avoids death. I mean, you know, we, we don't need to bury our heads in the sand. But I do think we need to up our game in terms of, uh, uh, of using evidence to evaluate when it, whether any of, of what I've been speaking about today uh, or um, a lot of the great ideas I've heard throughout the day, uh, whether there's evidence to support that. And, and um, this is a, a nice paper by um, uh, Kidwell and all looking at, at, at badges. And, and this is not a, a, a slight or a criticism. It, the authors acknowledge themselves that then, you know, this is a pre-post, it, it's not optimal. It, it, it would have been better um, if it could have been a randomized trial of, of different journals. Um, and, and I will come, come back to this in, in, in a moment. And um, there are many different sort of experimental designs uh, that we can think about uh, in this setting is perhaps a randomized step wedge. Uh, we, we need to think about what could the primary outcome be if we're looking at um, open science practices. It, could it be the percent of core open science practices uh, across institutions over time? whether organizations have implemented the digital dashboard, have a short term uh, or and a long term impact on commercialization or IP. So there's lots of different things that we need to ask, but I'm, I'm just sort of uh, making a, a call that we, we up our game in terms of uh, evaluating what we're trying to implement. I think this will be possible in, if funders um, you know, uh, step up to the plate. Um, I <clears throat> obviously I don't know in detail what's going on at the NIH, but I can tell you that at CIHR, um, they don't have a funding stream for open science or re reproducibility. And I think without public funders coming to offer that, it's going to be very, very difficult. And it may be one reason why Europe is, is quite far ahead in terms of public funding. There are, I know, for example, uh, in the Netherlands, ZOM NB, MV, I believe, they're on, I don't know, the third or fourth round of um, uh, funding research around reproducibility. Uh, I think without funding, it's, it's going to be difficult to implement interventions and evaluate their impact. Um, I think that journals and academic institute, uh, uh, institutions, they, they need to more actively sort of participate in um, enabling um, open science. And I think I'm done there. So thank you very much. I, I'll stop sharing. And, and just to say that I was really interested in trying to engage uh, in, in some discussions here. Great, so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to stick those in the Q&A and I can read those out loud. Thank you. Maybe while, while people are talking, I will uh, jump in here. Um, 
we had some discussion this morning about um, kind of, you know, what happens when the criteria are changing, right? Um, so, you know, um, how do you see the role of, you know, kind of open science reproducibility in, you know, promotion in particular um, relating to the fact that like, you know, the, the, the rules may be different, you know, when a person is, you know, is up for a promotion compared to when they started, right? Um, that was a question that was asked this morning. I, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's a really good question and I, I don't think that it's a binary answer. I think it's a moving target. And I think there needs to be a, a degree of um, flexibility for a period of time where um, early career researchers um, will need to uh, have opportunities to sort of, to enable this to happen. And the expectation is, 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 is that this will be part and parcel of, of their uh, researcher assessment. Um, and, and one can imagine that uh, more senior uh, people, they, um, they may require some additional time in order for this to happen, but it, it is possible for an institution to sort of say, look, we're going to introduce this on July the 1st, 2021. Uh, the expectations are for early career researchers, they will have this implemented within a 12 month period. Uh, and you know, for senior, senior sciences, it, it may be a 24 month period. Uh, I, I say that, and perhaps I have some in, implicit bias because when I uh, deal with senior scientists, uh, all of them almost unanimously say, oh yeah, this is fine. It, it, I, it, it doesn't apply to me. I, I think they're the most resistant perhaps, and they may need some extra time to, um, uh, uh, to be um, integrated into a, a new system. Um, yeah, but it's definitely an interesting question how to get somebody who has built their entire career around methods that, you know, people like you and I walk around saying are not <laughs> reliable methods to use, yeah. Um, yeah. getting them to, like, you know, uh, like, you know, obviously some of it, you know, I'm perfectly willing to admit that the way that I did my studies 20 years ago was, you know, um, almost certainly a way that led to a higher um, rate of false positives than the nominal rate that I thought I was controlling things at, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's difficult for a, a lot of, you know, a more senior accomplished investigators to, to say that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think we need to, first of all, a, a sort of acknowledge that this is not going to be binary, that there is going to have to be a degree of flexibility for a period of time. And I'm perhaps not the smartest one, uh, but I would say that it, it may be uh, sort of institutional specific and that it may be, so for example, we're, we're uh, developing implement, implementation strategies around data sharing uh, for the um, Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital. One of the issues is they have a grassroots committee ar around open science. So the question is that grass grassroots committee it consists of a, a, a spectrum of researchers from senior to early career. It may be to go to them and sort of take this up with them and ask them for that institution, how do you think that that uh, could work out? And then I think we have a responsibility to, to let others know that's what we're trying to do with the Hong Kong principles is it, and, and Dora are doing it is in a sense to create almost like case law here are examples of how this was implemented at institution A. It might be useful for institution B and, and we need to make that available for them to see. Yeah, I think that, that's a great point. Um, maybe I'll also kind of point back to another question that came up this morning around um, the, the costs to a researcher of of doing rigorous research, right? It obviously makes it harder to publish papers and tell buttoned up stories 
when you're, you know, when you're using uh, questionable research practice, sorry, when we're using rigorous research practices, it's harder to, to get the, to have a buttoned up story or, and it, you're actually going to have a lower probability of positive outcomes, which is going to make it harder to publish things, period, given the bias against negative outcomes. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how to balance, you know, you, you've talked a bit about kind of bringing you know, the kind of open science reproducibility criteria into advancement. But um, do you have thoughts about how to how to kind of, you know, work up work with that trade off? I think the, I think one of the first things is that an institution needs to be able to indicate that they they're up for change. And uh, there are several examples of um, institutions doing this in Europe. Um, I think the second thing is that um, I think that needs to be a, an institution-wide discussion. What are the trade-offs? What are people willing to live with? It, it, a strong signal could be to say that um, an institution is not going to look at the number of publications, nor are they going to be concerned about the journal impact factor. They could say, you know, we are interested in two publications, and they may be publications that have statistically positive or otherwise results. And we could ask the uh, researcher, why did you nominate these papers? So, for example, there are um, you know, um, there is a, a something called over, uh, Overturn. And Overturn is a, um, it's a website where uh, they have, I think, over 4 million uh, policy documents. And you can go and look to see whether any of your research has informed policy. Well, you know, maybe that's, that, that's a, a, an interesting way of thinking about impact. Uh, maybe we should say, oh, this, uh, this study was not statistically significant. It, um, it, it didn't change the world. However, it's the data, has, I made the data publicly available and the code, etc. And it's been reused 14 times in the last 12 months. Uh, I, I think they're hugely impactful. And we, we need, we need people from the top to come and say this is important and then we we need people like grassroots committees again to say this is important so it, it seems to me it's not just a bottom up or a top down they it has to be both and they have to be i think singing from the from the same playlist yeah i think that's exactly right um and then the question is just how to make that happen so yeah um if there are no other questions, it looks like there's nothing else in the, the Q&A panel right now. Um, let's uh, thank Dr. Boer again for, uh, for a really uh, awesome talk. Um, and 